Thank you, Dietrich. Thank you very much for the organizers for this uh, very nice invitation. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a, a joint work with uh, Sergio Kleiman and Igor Rodiansky. And uh, it's about a result. Uh, so I'll start, I'll start actually with uh, some easier material which is connected with some model problems. But uh, let me just say for now, because I'll be much more specific in the second lecture where I'll really explain what is this result um, and, and start explaining how you prove it. This first lecture, I want it to be introductive, so I'll start with model problems. But let me still say <coughs> that uh, for now that the Einstein equation, so let me just write it like this. So Einstein equation um, is an evolution problem. So it has hyperbolic type, so it's an evolution problem. So I'll, I'll be speci more specific. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll say everything you need to know about it. So don't, don't worry if uh, I know that there it's a broad audience. So uh, I'll say everything you need to know about the evolution problem for the Einstein equation. But for now, let me just uh, say that it's an evolution problem. And I will be interested, as any evolution problem, starting with ODEs, the first question you can ask is the one of local existence of solution. So what is called local Local, yeah, the, the one, uh, local well poseness or local existence, if you want, of solutions. So I'll be interested with the question of local existence. And in particular, the, the main topic here would be uh, for rough data. OK, so that will be the, this result is about making sense of very rough solution of the Einstein equation. Uh, so. Unfortunately, because I need to do something introductory at the beginning, I will only motivate this again in the second lecture. So there, there will be motivations for why uh, we think it's, it's, a, it's a very relevant question to look at this type of results. Uh, but for now, uh, let me just say that um, looking for local existence for rough data uh, already um, turns out, will turn out, I mean, as a, as a first motivation for this lecture, let me say that to be able to answer that question this will uh, lead us to explore uh, the very uh, nice nonlinear structure of the Einstein equation. Okay, so take this as a first motivation, the understanding of the, of the very nice null structure of the Einstein equation. If you don't understand it, you will not be able to answer that question or to, to prove the result I'm talking about. So this will be a way to, to explore this nice nonlinear structure, which we'll see is called a null we call null structure. Okay. So in this first lecture, again, it, it's introductive. So I'll, I'll go to this problem in the second lecture. The first lecture I wanted uh, to be introductive. So we'll start as the simpler model problem. We'll look at, we'll review uh, the local well poseness for nonlinear wave equation with rough data. Okay, in this first lecture, and this will naturally introduce us to the problem in the second lecture for the Einstein equation themselves. Okay, so here I'll start just with a simple model problem of a nonlinear wave equation. Um, uh, just to, to set some notation and to, so that we can understand the difficulties. And then in the second lecture, uh, I'll actually state uh, the theorem uh, I want to talk about, which is the Bondi delta curvature theorem. I'll give an overview, I'll give some motivations uh, again for this problem in the second lecture. Uh, again, apology, the motivations are only going coming in the second lecture. And then I'll give an overview of the proof. And then the last two lectures will be on a specific part of the proof, uh, which is the fact that uh, you need, uh, at the heart of this proof, is a representation formula for the wave equation, okay, what is called, um, uh, uh, I mean, if you want a plane wave representation, we, you, we will need a plane wave representation for the wave equation on a curved background with, with the background having limited regularity. So this will lead us to the most, the most basic building block of this representation, which is the econal equation. Uh, so I'll talk about the econal equation and how you can control it on a rough background. And then finally, in the last lecture, I'll talk uh, about plane wave representation of the wave equation on a curved background, and a curve and rough background. So how you construct it, how you control it. Uh, so this plane wave representation, uh, you can think of the one of the standard wave equation if you want to have something in mind. It will turn out to be a four integral operator. And this will also be related to the uh, so-called uh, lax parametrics of geometric optics. Okay, so I know there is also a component of people from microanalysis in this room. So this, they will certainly uh, be familiar with, uh, at least with the parametrics, with the plane representation. 
for this last lecture. Okay, so this is, this is the plan of, of the course. And I'll, I want to start today with just a, an introduction. Uh, so I apologize for experts. I'll do, there, are, there will be some very basic stuff here. Uh, but since the audience is broad, I, I thought it's good to, to recall so, some things in the first lecture. Uh, maybe already in the second hour, you, you will see some uh, more uh, advanced stuff. Okay, so the, the first, this first hour will be very basic. I'll review the energy method for the linear wave equation. Uh, that allow, will allow me to introduce some notations. And then I'll talk about energy method for nonlinear wave equation, uh, low regularity well positions for nonlinear wave equations, because that's my model problem. I'll talk about uh, this, uh, the so-called null structure, which should be in connection with the, this nonlinear structure I, I talked about uh, for the ancient equation. And finally, I'll review uh, the proof of well positiveness uh, for the classical Young Mills in the energy space in 3 plus 1, because that's going to be the main model problem, which is, uh, I mean, it's going to be a very useful, relevant model problem for, the, for what we want to do for the ancient equation. Okay, and then with this, we'll be prepared to, to the second lecture to, to, the, to the main result on, on the ancient equation. Okay, so let me, uh, again, I'm starting with, uh, with basic stuff, so let me start with the linear wave equation. Okay, so again, uh, maybe let me emphasize the following. The Einstein equation, so what we want to do is the Einstein equation, that's, that turns out, for instance, if you pick its, its gauge invariant, and if you pick a specific gauge, Namely, uh, I'll talk about this in the second lecture. If you pick coordinates, special coordinates, which are called wave coordinates, you can rewrite it as a system of nonlinear wave equation. Okay, and that leads us to study as a simple model problem a scalar nonlinear wave equation. So let me simplify in this lecture and just take a scalar nonlinear wave equation. Okay, that will be the model problem here. And then let me uh, even simplify further and start this lecture with a scalar linear wave equation. Okay. Uh, wave equation. Okay, so I'll actually go reverse. Uh, so I'll start with the simplest model with linear wave equation. Then I talk about scalar nonlinear wave equation. Then I'll talk about a simple model, which is the Young-Mills system, which will be a simple model for what we want to do, which is a system of, it's actually a system of hyperbolic types. So if you want a system of nonlinear wave equation, and then uh, this will allow us in the second lecture to, to tackle the, the Einstein equation. Okay. Okay. But let me start with very something very basic, the linear wave equation. So I'm setting everything. Everything will be now one plus three, so one for time three plus space, because that's what's relevant to the Einstein equation. That's the physical dimension, and Okay, can I remove this? Sorry, I just want to remove this. Yeah. Okay, and then, <coughs> uh, okay, so let me start with a flat wave operator. So a flat wave operator is minus dt squared plus Laplacian. And you want to, sorry, <laughs> it's dangerous. And it's the first lecture, so I... <laughs> I need to be, I need to pay attention. Okay, anyway, I need to be careful. Okay, so the corresponding initial value problem, so it's an evolution problem, you have two derivatives in time. So the corresponding initial value problem, you should expect to have to prescribe the, f the function and the first derivative at time zero. And the co therefore, the, co the Cauchy, the so Cauchy problem or evolution problem for the wave equation is derivation phi is zero. And then phi at time zero is phi zero, and dt phi at time zero is phi one, where phi zero, phi one are the uh, so-called Cauchy data. Okay, so you have to prescribe yourself functions, and then you can solve the, this problem. Uh, so let me, so uh, of course I don't intend to review uh, everything that's known about the linear wave equation. It would probably take me the, the whole lecture, but uh, I just want to review what is called the, the energy method, because that's what's going to, to drive us here. So the energy method for the solution of the flat wave equation, you consider, consider this uh, functional here of the function, which is the so-called energy, which is one half of the integral of R3 of dt phi at time t plus the space gradient of phi at time t dx. Okay, so it's very easy to show that this energy is conserved if you satisfy the flat wave equation. You just have to differentiate in time this expression, integrate by part and use the equation, and you find that the energy is conserved. That is, for all t, this energy does not depend on t. It's equal to an energy at time zero. Okay, so that actually allows you to control as time goes on. I mean, this shows exactly that actually the 
one derivative of the metric in L2, one the derivative of the function, sorry, in L2 is preserved in time. Okay, so then the energy method, it's not enough to control one derivative, you'd like to control several derivatives, so usual step then is to start differentiate your equation, okay? So what you do is, so let me here introduce the Sobolev space HS of R3 for S positive, which is one minus Laplacian minus S over two uh, times L2. So in other words, these are the functions for which S derivative in, are in L2. Uh, so let me state here that for hyperbolic problem in higher dimensions, the regularity that is transported, as can be seen from the energy, is, is the Sobolev regularity. I mean, it's the L2-based regularity. So we always have to measure regularity in L2-based space, not LP-based space, for the wave equation. I mean, at least in higher dimensions. And so if you differentiate S time, your, uh, actually S minus one time the equation, and you run again the energy estimate, so here notice that this operator does commute with the flat wave operator, so you don't have any junk terms, so you can uh, differentiate S time your equation, run the energy estimate, and you get now this identity, which tells you that this time S derivatives in L2 are propagated, okay? And then this allows you immediately to, from this a priori bound, you can easily infer that if you start with the data in HS and phi 1 in HS minus 1, then you get existence and uniqueness of a solution, which is continuous with values in HS and C1 with values in HS minus 1, okay? Okay, so now, uh, more relevant to the Einstein equation, there will be a curved background. So what is more relevant, actually, is not the flat wave equation. It's uh, the wave equation on the curved background. Uh, so here, you have a Lorentzian manifold. So here, in all, in all this series of lectures, I will always denote M a manifold of dimension 4. And G will always be a metric of signature minus plus plus plus. Okay, and of course the most basic. Oh, okay. Let's do it. Let me take another one. <coughs> so the most basic example is the Minkowski space-time. Well, actually, I think it's there. Yeah. Okay. So the most basic example is the Minkowski space-time. So you take your manifold to be R1 plus 3 and the metric M to be the Minkowski matrix. So it's minus dt squared plus dx1 squared plus dx2 squared plus dx3 squared. So the Minkowski space-time <coughs> is to Lorentzian geometry what the Euclidean space-time, uh, what the Euclidean space sorry, is to Riemannian geometry. Okay? okay, anyway, so now I want to consider a general Lorentzian manifold in the physical uh, relevant dimension uh, 4. And the wave operator here uh, now in this curve, curve background is Darmation G of phi. So here I, uh, I write it in a covariant way. So it's G alpha beta, D alpha, D beta phi, where this, uh, here this bold D always will denote the uh, covariant, the different, uh, covariant derivative associated to the metric, okay? And of course you can also write it in coordinates. So here let me give you, uh, that you can actually write it in several ways in the coordinates. You can use the Christoffel symbols, but you can also use this formula here involving the coefficients of the metric in a coordinate system. Okay. Uh, okay, so of course this operator is to Lorentzian geometry, what the Laplace Beltram is in Riemannian geometry. And in particular, the connection with the previous slide is that if you take the Minkowski metric, you recover the usual flat wave operator. Okay? Okay, so what is the corresponding Cauchy problem here? So let me uh, introduce some notations here, which I will use in the rest of the lecture. So by sigma, I always denote a space-like uh, hypersurface of, of my uh, Lorentz manifold. That is that dimension of sigma is equal to 3. And space-like is the fact that, so if I denote by T the unit normal, so let me call capital T unit normal. Uh, sorry, I mean, I know. I mean, T, well, okay. If you're used to Riemannian geometry, T is maybe a bit weird for a normal. It looks like a tangent, but it's a normal uh, to sigma. It's because it comes from d by dt in Minkowski space-time. So it's space-like. Uh, space-like means that if I take the unit normal, it's ne GTT is negative, so you have to normalize by minus one, okay? Whereas uh, time-like would be uh, GTT is equal to plus one. Uh, and there is a third case which means null, but we'll see it uh, later on. Okay, so for, for now, sigma is such that the unit normal, the dot product of the unit normal is minus one. And, uh, no, I guess that's enough. Okay, and, and m, of course, if you want, m is, is this, uh, that's m. Okay, so that's m, and sigma is just a hypersurface. 
And then the Cauchy problem is uh, your wave operator Dalmatian G of phi is zero in, in your space time. And then you have to prescribe the initial data. So phi restricted to sigma is phi zero. And T of phi restricted to sigma is phi one. And of course, the connection with the previous problem is that if, I, if you are in Minkowski, uh, so for example, if I take, if I take M G to be R1 plus 3 uh, with, with the Minkowski matrix. So if I take the Minkowski space, if I take sigma to be t is equal to 0, the hypersurface t is equal to 0, and if I take capital T to be d by dt, you recover precisely the, the flat, uh, the Cauchy problem for the flat wave equation. Okay, so that's the, that's the connection. Okay, so you want to run the energy method for, the, for this uh, problem. So, um, let me review uh, the, the energy momentum tensor. Okay, so we introduce, so you take phi such that the version G of phi is F. So here I'm taking a non trivial right hand side. Uh, that's for future application to the nonlinear problem. Okay, as, as we'll move to the nonlinear problem, F will be a nonlinearity depending back on phi. So for, for this slide, let me introduce a non trivial right hand side because that's going to be useful later. And you want to run energy estimates. Uh, for this, okay, so uh, I need to exhibit, uh, if you want, the energy. For this, I'm going to exhibit something called the energy momentum tensor associated to the solution phi of this problem. So you, you have Q alpha beta is, so it's a two tensor. So here alpha beta, yeah, sorry, I should, I should mention from now on that. Um, okay, so again, some notations here. All my green indices, alpha, beta, I guess I maybe have the gamma delta, mu, nu, etc. All my grid indices, they run from alpha is 0, 1, 2, 3. 0 is for time, 1, 2, 3 for space directions. So all my grid indices will be space time indices running from 0 to 1, 2, 3. And all my, uh, well, Latin indices, I guess you say, uh, these guys will be running for this will be space indices, so they only will be running for one, two, three. Okay, so here I have space time indices. So in other words, this is a two tensor. This is a two tensor on my, uh, on my uh, space time M, on my Lorentzian manifold MG. And uh, so alpha runs from 0, 1, 2, 3, beta 0, 1, 2, 3. And you define Q alpha beta is D alpha phi, D beta phi minus one half of G alpha beta. And then you have the dot product of uh, the grint of phi with itself. So g mu nu, d, nu, d mu phi, d nu phi. Okay, so then if you uh, take the, I mean, here you have a straightforward computation. You can check that if you take the divergence of these two tensor, then uh, if, uh, so you have two possibilities. So if d alpha falls, uh, if the covariant derivative d alpha falls on d alpha phi, then you get d alpha, d alpha down phi. That's the covariant wave operator. So that gives you f times d beta phi. So that's this term. And if it, if it falls on d beta, then it's going to be ca canceled by, by the term where the derivative falls here because you have a minus sign. And you have a 1 half, but the derivative could fall here or here, which gives you a 2. Okay, so if it falls here, it's going to be canceled by the derivative of this term. And therefore, you only get the first term, which is f times d beta of phi. Okay, it's a, it's a very simple computation. So with this in mind, so you have a divergence. And now I want to, uh, I want to contract this tensor to get a one form. So I'm going to introduce the one form P alpha, which is my tensor Q alpha beta contracted with T beta, where T again is the unit normal future directed of my space-like hypersurface. But here now I'm going to have two space-like hypersurfaces. OK, so let me maybe. OK, so I guess the picture you should have in mind is that you will foliate, so your space time or your, sorry, so I always say space time. So my Lorentz and manifold MG, I always call it the space time. And you want to foliate your space time by a time function. Okay, so you have, so let's say you start, so now sigma, I'm going to call it sigma zero. That's your first, that's your initial slice. So that, that corresponds to time zero if you want. And then you foliate by a time function in, so time function means that the level sets of the time of the function are all space-like. Okay, that's a time function. Of course, there are tons of time functions, but the easiest one is the t is t level sets of t in Minkowski. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm in, I, I want to run an energy estimate exactly as we did for the flat wave equation. I want to run an energy estimate. I want to relate, in other words, the derivative, uh, I mean, uh, the, the derivative of phi at time zero with the derivative of phi at time t. So let me call R the space-time region, which is the one between, between these two space-like surfaces. And let me call T the unit normal future directed. Okay, and let me also remark that if you look at the exterior, if you look at the normal which is uh, outward pointing to R, you see that here you have minus T actually at for sigma zero. Okay, and I want to, I'm going to integrate uh, on this space-time region. Okay. Okay, so you contract uh, you contract your one form Q, PI, uh, Q, uh, your contract, sorry, your two tensor Q alpha beta with uh, your vector field T. So you have Q alpha beta T beta up, and that gives you a one form P alpha. And now again, I want to compute the divergence of P alpha. Okay, so I have D alpha P alpha. So what do you pick? So uh, you have two cases. Either the D alpha falls on Q alpha beta, in which case I pick F D beta phi. So I get Okay, you see, you get f d beta phi t beta, so you contract t beta with d beta phi, that, is, that gives you t of phi. Okay, so you get f t of phi, that's when the, di the divergence falls on q alpha beta. If the d alpha falls on t beta, then you get q alpha beta contracted with a two tensor pi, oh, sorry, there's a typo, okay. Uh, so here, it, of course, uh, so the indices here, either you put the indices up here or here. Um, indices needs to be, two indices needs to be put up, okay? Okay, so you have a contraction, sorry for the typo, so you have a contraction between uh, two, two tensors here. Uh, so Q alpha beta, because you did not differentiate it, so you still have Q alpha beta. And then, first, actually what you get here, uh, because Q alpha beta is symmetric, you get the symmetric derivative of T, uh, which I denote by T pi alpha beta. Okay, so the symmetric derivative, first derivative of P is D alpha T beta plus D beta T alpha. Okay, so that's the symmetrized first order derivative of T. That's the so-called deformation tensor. So I guess you, you heard already uh, a lot about deformation tensors uh, in particular, uh, but here uh, it's the deformation tensor associated with vector field T. And in particular, uh, I guess w what you should know is that if T is killing, so I guess with the course of loss you've heard about killing tensors. Uh, here it's even easier, it's a, killing, uh, it's a killing vector field. So if T is a killing vector field, that's equivalent, you can show that it's equivalent to having a deformation tensor which is zero for all values of alpha beta. Okay, uh, so T, T killing means that uh, T, T killing means that it's the generator T is the gener infinitesimal generator of a symmetry. Okay, so if you have a symmetry of your spacetime, then automatically the deformation tensor is zero. Of course, that's a very special case. Usually your manifold has no, I mean, in general, it doesn't have any symmetries, and that will be the case for us, but it's good to remember that if you have a symmetry, you get zero. In particular, of course, in the case of Minkowski, if you're in Minkowski, in R1 plus 1, in R1 plus 3, sorry, um, then uh, if you take T is equal to D by DT, then it corresponds to the uh, symmetry by uh, invariance by translation in time, and therefore you have D over DT pi alpha beta is equal to zero. Okay, so this is your divergence relation. And now, of course, I'd like to apply Stokes' theorem. So I'd like to integrate this divergence relation on the space-time region, which will be the space-time region R. So if you integrate, of course, you get that you're going to get that D alpha P alpha over R by Stokes' theorem. That's the integral of the boundary of R of P uh, alpha contracted with uh, okay, of P alpha nu alpha, where nu is the outward pointing normal, normal, unit normal. Okay, uh, to R, sorry, to, uh, to region R. Okay, so of course, in our case, we, what do we get? We get, in our case, this is equal to, therefore, you get the integral of a sigma t 
of P contracted with T, so P alpha T alpha, minus, because it's minus T on sigma zero, minus integral of a sigma zero of P alpha T alpha. Okay, that's your boundary term which comes from Stokes theorem. Okay, and it turns out that if you compute this, so what do you get? Okay, so I guess I should move this. Okay, so of course here you have P alpha T alpha, that's uh, Q uh, T T, and therefore that's uh, T of phi, you see that you have T of phi square, and then G minus one half GTT is negative one, so that's plus one half, and then uh, you have the dot product of the gradient of phi with itself, which you can write, so I'm going to, uh, okay, so I'm decomposing, yeah, well, okay, so if you compute the dot product, you will see that you get T of phi square, minus T of phi square, plus the gradient of phi square, where here, that's the induced covariant derivative on sigma T. Well, actually, it's the covariant gradient here. Induced covariant gradient on sigma T. Okay, so here, if you compute, you see that you simply get, so the one half, uh, you, you simply get one half of T of phi square plus gradient of phi square. Okay, and therefore, you get this relation. You get your two boundary terms one with each sign because the unit normal is t and negative t, the outward one. And then you have the integral of the space-time region from the fact that you integrate in on the space-time region, the divergence of p alpha, okay? And, okay, as you can see, you, that gives you, that relates the control of first order derivative of phi in L2 on sigma t with the control on the initial slice. And of course, if you have a right-hand side, in particular, if you have a non problem, you get an, uh, an additional joint term here, okay? And you can check that you get back what we had for the energy estimate for the flat wave equation simply by taking, so if, for instance, I'm taking the Minkowski space-time, then uh, I'm having, so I'm having T is D by DT, uh, which implies that the deformation tensor is zero. And if I'm taking F to be zero, if I take the wave equation without right hand side, then you can see indeed that this term vanishes because f is zero, this term vanishes because the, the deformation tensor is zero, and therefore you get back the usual energy estimate for the wave equation. Okay, so it's just a, it's a generalization to a general background. Okay, so now uh, I like to do, uh, uh, now what I like to do is simply, I like to do the same thing, but I like to uh, introduce the case where on this boundary, so here I took the case where the, the boundary of my space time region is purely space like. Uh, sigma z, it consists of sigma zero and sigma t, which are both space like. I want to consider the case of a boundary which is null, because it's going to be very important to, to what we do. Okay, so that's, that's called the characteristic energy estimate, and I'd like to understand what happens when you do a characteristic energy estimate. And for this, I'd like to review a little bit my notation on null hypersurfaces, okay, because we'll, we'll have to integrate on those. Okay, so a null hypersurface uh, is a hypersurface in the Royston space-time such that uh, if I denote by L as normal, then I have GLL is zero. In other words, the normal is a null vector, okay? Um, well, okay, so maybe I should have started with the example. and Let's put them in the end. So, of course, the typical example of null hypersurfaces, uh, yeah, yeah, I want to keep this, uh, I want to keep this, so let me remove it. Ah, je peux les faire monter yeah. Ah, bah c'est génial. Ah, pardon, oui. Non, parce que là, j'y arrivais pas. <rire> je trouvais que je manquais de force dans les bras. Ah, j'ai pas besoin d'appuyer, d'accord, ok. Ah, bah c'est encore mieux. Ah, le rouge, c'est pour... Ah, oh, bon, vous s'y arrêtez tout seul. <laughs> Alors, uh, be, uh, ah oui, donc, ok, so the main two examples, well, actually, they are on my, uh, ah, okay, I don't, sorry, it's totally useless because they are here. So the main typical example in Nikoski, well, okay, maybe I can draw a picture, it would be nice to have a picture. Okay, so a general, uh, a general hypersurface looks like this, of course, a null hypersurface, so that's going to be my null hypersurface H. So you could have, again, in Minkowski space-time, you can have a cone, so let me just draw the future directed cone. 
so that would be one example. So that would be t is equal to uh, t is equal to r in radial coordinates. Okay. And uh, the other example that will be well, actually, the one that would be relevant to this talk is, is this one. It's uh, it's a hyperplane, a null hyperplane. So, for instance, t plus x dot omega is equal to zero, where omega belongs to the two sphere. Okay, so these are the two examples which are relevant, uh, I mean, which, uh, which are the most important in Minkowski space-time. Uh, in, this, in this lecture series of lecture, the one that is relevant is actually the hyperplane and not the cone, okay? Uh, the cone is, of course, very important, but for what I'm going to talk about, because I'll do some analysis in Fourier space, you should think that I'm going to use these hyperplanes, and here, omega, you should see it as a Fourier variable. Okay, it's going to be a frequency variable. And uh, I'm going to use this collection of hyperplanes and the fact that I can rotate them will allow me to generate uh, things in Fourier space, okay? Okay, so the, really the, the one which is relevant to this talk, the one you should have in mind is, is, is actually this one, okay? So that's why I always draw my, my null hypersurfaces like this, okay? It's because I have plane, hyperplanes in, in the mind. Okay, so uh, in particular what is uh, maybe a bit uh, strange if you're not used to it uh, with null hypersurfaces is the fact that uh, well, because the normal is null, uh, one, first of all, one, one interesting thing, well, there are two interesting things going on, but the first one is that the normal actually belongs to the tangent space itself, okay, because GLL, the, the tangent space of H is uh, all the vector fields that are orthogonal to L, but because L is orthogonal to itself, it belongs itself to the, to the space. So in particular, my normal here sits actually, is actually tangent to H, okay, so that's my normal L. Okay, and, and you see in a second why I'm, I'm, I'm writing L like this. And so that's one vector field. And now I'd like to complete my vector field such that I get a, a so-called null frame. So I need a frame that is, I need four vectors that generate all my vector fields. And I, I, I would like to decompose all my vector fields on, on a frame. So for this, I need three other vectors. So there are already two other vectors that you can get is the fact that this is three dimensional because it's hypersurface in dimension four. And therefore you get two additional vectors which I'm going to, de to call E1, E2. Okay, so here, uh, please pay attention to the notations because these are notations I'm going to use all the time. Uh, of course, all the experts know them uh, by heart, but if you've never s seen them, then it's useful to, 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 to pay attention to them. Okay, so E1, E2, so because here, the, uh, of course, it's a blackboard, sorry, but you know, it's dimension two, so I have two vectors in that direction, so I get E1, E2. So that E1, E2, L is the basis of the tangent space of H. And then, of course, if I want a basis of M, I still need to add one vector, one vector field, which I'm going to call L bar, which is this one. Okay, so L bar is, out, is outside of, of H. I hope you can see. Um, okay, so I have this third vector field, L bar, which is outside of H. Okay, sorry, maybe, maybe on this side you don't quite see what I'm going on. Uh, yeah, is, is it okay? Everybody sees the, yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, well, that's interesting, okay. Um, Okay so, uh, okay, so how can you pick them? Okay, so now I, I, I want to pick them. You can actually, so first of all, E1, E2, because they are in the tangent space of H, by definition, they are orthogonal to L, okay? Because uh, the tangent space is all vectors orthogonal to L. So E1, E2 are orthogonal to L. But furthermore, you can, you know, by simple linear algebra, you can check that because you're in Lorentz in space-time, it has signature minus plus, plus, plus. This forces you to have E1, E2, which are space-like. In other words, their dot product with themselves is positive. So I can normalize them to one, and furthermore, I can uh, force them to make an orthonormal basis if I like. Okay, so E1, E2 is orthonormal in the sense that G, E1, E2, I mean G, E, A, E, E, B is delta E, B. Yeah, sorry, that's my uh, other last notation for the indices. When I say A, B, A, B, that will, and maybe C if I need, and D if I need, A, B, this will always be in the indices which run from 1 to 2, which, and they will always correspond to E1, E2. Okay. Okay. So uh, so E one E two is uh, normalized so that uh, it's it's uh, it's it's also normal and it's all it's normal to L simply because it sits in the tangent space of H. And then for my last vector, again by linear algebra, you can check that this last vector you can force it to be uh, uh, null. G L bar L bar is zero. Uh, you can normalize it with L to be G L bar L is negative two and uh, G uh, L bar E A is equal to zero. So in other words, it's uh, L bar is orthogonal to E1 and E2, okay? 
So that's what is called a null frame. Uh, and, and, and please note that uh, there is no, uh, there is still a freedom there. There is no way to normalize a null vector like you would do uh, with space like M time like vector. You cannot normalize by its length because the, its length is zero. So in particular, I can, whenever I have a null frame, I can always change the null frame to this. So if I type L, L bar, E1, E2, sorry. Well, first of all, of course, I have, uh, well, I have another freedom. I have, first, I have one freedom, which is the fact that E1, E2 spans, you know, uh, so you have a rotation for E1, E2, you can rotate them. But I'm, I want actually to talk about this freedom, which is maybe less usual, which is the fact that if I multiply by a scalar function uh, F, which is non-zero, then I, I have this frame, which also perfectly, which is also perfectly fine. Because I have no way to normalize the normal, FL is, is as, as good as a normal as, as L. Okay. So we'll see how we normalize later on. I like, wanted to point this out. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, the last thing I want to say is, um, so I'll, I use this notation all the time, but it's useful to understand what they correspond to in the flat case. Okay, so if I, for instance, if I take the cone, so if I take T is equal to R, so the future null cone. So of course then in that case, L, uh, well, I guess L is there. L is the generator of the cone. Uh, yeah, sorry, I should, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, well, let me draw it like this. So. Okay, so L is the generator of the cone. E1, E2 are uh, tangent to the two spheres. So that's L. L bar is there. And then E1, E2 are tangent to the two spheres here. So E1, E2, uh, are tangent to the two spheres. Okay, and in that case you have L, you can check that you have L is dt plus dr, L bar is dt minus dr, and uh, E1, E2, it's tangent to S2. So in other words, it's a basis, it's orthonormal the basis of TS2. E1, E2, orthonormal basis of the tangent space of S2. Okay, and the other example, which is actually the one which is relevant, is the case of a hyperplane. So if that's H with, if that's T plus X dot omega is equal to zero, then again, L is here, E1, E2 are there, L bar is there, and L is simply given as DT minus omega gradient X uh, L bar is given as dt plus omega scalar gradient x, and then E1, E2, it's an orthonormal basis of the orthogonal space of omega bar in R3. I mean, the orthogonal of omega in R3. So. Okay? Okay, so now with this, I'd like to uh, do the characteristic energy estimate. What is, what is called the characteristic energy estimate. So again, the characteristic energy estimate is simply the fact that I'm going to integrate my energy momentum tensor. I mean, I'm going to integrate this relation, the alpha, the div divergence of P, exactly as I did before. But now I'm taking more general space-time regions. And in particular, I'm allowing the boundary of R to have a null, to be a null hypersurface, or at least to be a piece of null hypersurfaces. Okay, so in, in general, you will have a piece of space like and piece of null. Surfaces. Okay, so for instance, let me draw one such region here. Uh, yeah, let me, yeah, maybe I'd like to, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, no, okay, let me do it here. So, um, I want to keep these two, so what can I do? Okay, this I can remove, I don't think I need it. Okay. So now I'd like to exchange, well, I have to do it here. Sorry, so which one? So Probably this one. No. Okay, no. 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 But uh, how do I do the other one then? No, no. I'm, I'm talking about the. Ah, okay. It's the same. Okay, it's the same. Sorry. Okay, I thought there were two that was. Yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry for the confusion. It's the same. Okay. Well, anyway, okay. So let me remove this. Okay, so let me take a spa a falling, the spalling space-time region, for instance. I can take, for instance, uh, a piece of sigma t. Okay, so that's a piece of sigma t. So that's sigma t here. That's sigma t. That's sigma zero. And then 
that's R. And then, uh, and then that's my piece of null hypersurface. So this, this is H1 and this is H2. Okay, these are two null hypersurfaces. Okay, so I'm taking a space-time region now. It's still bounded by sigma zero and sigma t. I don't go all the way here. I'm taking null hypersurfaces which, uh, which uh, end up there. Okay? And I like to consider this space-time region. So I like to integrate again my relation. So I think, uh, yeah, okay. So I'm integrating d alpha p alpha. And the general, equal, the general formula that you get after using Stokes' theorem is that the integral of, on the boundary of R, uh, so that's the boundary term you pick by Stokes, is Q contracted with T and nu, where nu is the outward, is the outward uh, pointing normal to dr. And then you have the integral of the space-time region of this thing, of the, of the, still the bulk is, of course, the, the same. Huh? What you change is the boundary term. Yeah. Okay, so now if you assume that uh, uh, I'm consider the portion of dr which is null, and again, we denote by L, it's normal. And now uh, I need to talk about normalization. Okay, uh, so the normalization I want to take is the following. So T, again, uh, you know, imagine that I have a, a foliation by, by sigma T's here. So I have other sigma T's, of course, in middle. So in particular, in each point on H, I have a definition of T, which is the normal. And then I have an L. And then I want to normalize the L instead of taking any uh, because I don't control the length of L, I'm going to take the L such that uh, this is T, and if you want, this is N, where N is orthogonal to T, okay? Okay, so I can always force, because I can control the, because I can choose freely the length of my normal L, I can always force it in a unique way, such that I can decompose it uniquely as T plus N, where T is my, uh, the vector field, uh, which is unit, uh, the unit future directly normal to my uh, time foliation, and n <coughs> is a vector which is orthogonal to t. So if you do this, first of all, you can always do it. And if you do it, there's a unique way of doing it. So, okay, so that's my normalization. I'm normalizing it using my time foliation. Okay? So now what's happening is, now let's compute QTL. So in other words, here, the term that I'm picking up, because L is my unit normal, is my normal, sorry, uh, on my null hypersurfaces, I'm picking QTL. So what do you get when you do QTL? So you can, it's a very straightforward computation. So you have, so let me, uh, do the following. So you have, so you have Q. So you have L is T plus N. You can very easily show that L bar. I mean, it's immediate that L bar has to be T minus N. Okay, and then uh, you get, uh, so you get Q T L. That's T of phi, L of phi, and then you see that G L T. It's G T T because N is orthogonal to T, so it's minus one. So you get plus one half. Of and then you get, uh, you can express the dot product of the gradient with itself on the null frame, so that would be uh, minus L phi L bar phi plus gradient of phi square. Okay, so what I call this, so in the, all the rest of the talk, this, this derivative is actually, uh, will always denote E1 of phi, this gradient will always be E1 of phi square plus E2 of phi square uh, very soon, actually, we'll introduce uh, a foliation of H by a scalar function, and this will be this will turn out to be the induced covariant derivative on, on the two surfaces that foliate H. Okay, but uh, yeah, so I'll do this later. So. Uh, okay, so here what you get so T first of all T you can decompose it as one half of L plus L bar. So T is one half plus L plus L bar plus L bar phi. Okay, and then if you uh, look at this, you can see that. This cancels with the L bar here, and you are left with one half of L of phi square plus, uh, uh, well, I always call this tangential gradient of phi. So in other words, you see that what you control, so this expression here, sorry, this expression here controls all the tangential relative to H. Okay, H, uh, the tangent space to H is, is uh, spanned by L and E1, E2. So this controls E1 and E2, and this controls L of phi. So you control all tangential derivatives. So in other words, you see that you get a new energy estimate. Uh, it's, also, it's also useful because you get a positive quantity. But nevertheless, it's degenerate. You're losing one, the L bar derivative. Okay? So here you can see that the only uh, derivative which is not controlled is L bar. Okay? Okay, so it's a, this, I mean, this will uh, turn out to be crucial. You have to realize that if you use a characteristic energy estimate, that is, if your energy estimate you have a piece of null uh, hypersurface, then uh, you don't control all the all derivatives as for a space-like surface. For a space-like, we control all derivatives, but for a null one, you miss 
the L bar, the, the L bar direction. Uh, okay. Yeah, yes. okay. Okay, so now let me talk uh, a little bit about the, the energy method for the nonlinear wave equation. Okay, so that's, that's it for the linear wave equation. And now I'd like to apply what we've seen for the nonlinear wave equation. I'd like to start uh, with, the problem, uh, with the following model problem. So as, we, uh, as I said, we're going to take as a model problem for the ancient equation. For this lecture, we'll take just a pro model problem of a simple nonlinear scalar wave equation. Okay? In principle, it's a system. Uh, and there is a gauge freedom, so it's more complicated than that. But let me just consider a scalar wave equation for the purpose of simplicity of the exposition. Okay, so you have Dalton version G of phi phi. So you see you have a wave operator uh, depending on a metric, a background metric. And here I want the metric to depend back on the solution. Okay, so G, G uh, takes a scalar function and gives you a Lorentzian metric. Uh, and in this way, the box, box G of phi, the, the Dalton version G of phi, depends on the solution phi itself, OK? Uh, I mean, I'll say a little bit uh, more later on uh, about this. But so you have first, this term is, is nonlinear, OK? Uh, it's linear, it's nonlinear because g depends back on phi. And then you have another nonlinearity uh, on the right-hand side. So this nonlinearity here, I'd like to uh, call it quasi-linear because it, uh, it uh, concerns uh, high order, the, the high order, highest order derivative of your equation, which are second order. So here you're nonlinear in the second order derivative. This nonlinearity I will call it semilinear because it does not involve second order derivatives. Okay, so the one on the left hand side is quasi-linear. This is semilinear. So in all together, this is a quasi-linear wave equation. Okay? And here the nonlinearity, so first of all, you set it on R1 plus 3. This is again to be in connection with the, uh, the ancient equation you know, in, in three space dimension. And uh, the nonlinearity here, for now on, uh, We'll discuss in, in much greater detail the structure, but for now on, let me just take a general structure the, where the only thing you know is that you are quadratic with respect to d5. Okay, that's the only relevant thing for now. Later on, will be more specific, but for now, let me simply say in terms of structure that this is quadratic with respect to d5. So it's a function. In other words, it's a, it's a linear combination of functions of phi times d5 squared. <coughs> okay, so again, the Cauchy problem you consider, uh, for the nonlinear problem, again, you consider phi times 0 is phi naught. dt phi times 0 is phi 1. And I'd like to investigate the well posedness in HS in my sober space HS. So I'm going to assume that phi naught is in HS of R3 and phi 1 in HS minus 1 of R3. And the question I would like to ask is for which S is this equation well posed? <coughs> and here, again, I apologize for this. I'll motivate, I'll motivate this business about rough local well posedness only in the second lecture. So for now, you have to believe me that this is an important issue in nonlinear PDEs, and in particular, in, in connection with the Einstein equation. <coughs> but uh, here, the question I'd like to ask is the one of rough local well -posedness. So how far can I push, how low can I push the S here? Okay. How rough can my initial data be, and I still am able to give you existence of a solution? OK, so how you proceed? Uh, so the, first of all, we were using the energy methods, method, so remember, You'd, lo you'd like to use the energy estimate in connection with commuting your equation with derivatives so that you get high, high order energy estimate and not only first uh, derivative, control of first order derivative. So I'm going to differentiate my equation S minus one time, and I'm going to perform the energy estimate, as we've seen. And because I have a right hand side, there is a last ingredient, which is that I want to absorb the right hand side. So I'm going to go use the, so, you know, the separated the Gronos lemma. Uh, I mean, the same that you use for ODEs. And that allows you, as a byproduct, to control. Uh, so now it's not an equality, it's an inequality. Here, this sign means that you control. Uh, you, there is a universal constant, which I don't want to make explicit. It doesn't matter. And therefore, you control the HS norm of all derivatives of your solution by uh, the initial data. So that's what you should expect in the linear wave equation. But because you're in a nonlinear wave setting, there is an additional term here. Uh, which is the norm of d phi in L infinity. Okay, so maybe just uh, what does this come from? I mean, this is, let me, let me still do this straightforward computation. So, okay, so uh, you take your wave operator, so you have down version g phi 
Uh, well, let me explain it in the seminar case. It doesn't, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, let me explain the ideas in the seminar case. It's easier, so. so seminar case is the fact that I'm taking box. I'm, I, I remove this G of phi. I'm simply, simply taking G of phi to be the Minkowski metric. So this is semilinear because the second order relative are not linear in the function. Okay, and let me even further simplify. Let me just take the model problem where work G of phi is D phi square. Okay, it will be easier. Okay, so let me take this. So I differentiate S time. Uh, actually, no, sorry, S minus one time. So what do you get? So imagine, well, imagine that S is an integer will make things easier. So I'm differentiating by an, an integer number of derivative. And on the right hand side, because it's an integer number derivative, I have the Leibniz rule. And let me just explicit one term, which is when all the, sorry, uh, when all the derivative fall on the same, on the same phi. And then you have all the cross terms, but let me not care about that. Okay, so if, if I have this, I run the energy estimate. So the energy estimate is going to tell me that it's going to give me the control of phi in HS. So it's going to tell me essentially the energy estimate is going to tell me that d over dt of phi in HS square plus dt phi in HS minus one square is controlled by uh, a constant because there are lots of terms and uh, you know. Uh, but uh, a constant times d phi. So I want to put d phi in L infinity in X, and I want to put the other one in L2. So that would give me uh, the HS norm. So sorry, there's, uh, well, uh, imagine I do this for all derivatives, so I get the whole HS norm here. Uh, and then uh, HS square, sorry. And then I have also dt phi, sorry. Plus dt phi, dt phi HS minus one square. Okay, so this is what you should expect. <clears throat> and then once you grown wall, so now I want to grown wall the control on the HS norm. And that's where by taking the grown wall, this term here will give you the term in red here. Okay, that's what you go when you, I mean, it's the linear, the usual grown wall's lemma for linear, uh, for linear uh, ODs where I forget the fact that this guy depends back on phi. Okay, so that's the grown wall's lemma. And now I need everything boils down to controlling this expression here. Okay? So the easiest thing you can do, I mean, now, of course, I'd like to close my estimate. That is, I'd like to, what you'd like to control, I want to control this back also from the initial data. Okay, so I need to have an, an, est an estimate which basically tells me that this guy is controlled by the HS norm of the initial data. Okay? So at this stage, uh, let me mention that you can forget, I mean, in principle, to understand this problem, forget that it's nonlinear. Just, you know, assume that phi satisfies the linear wave equation and ask yourself, how can you control it back uh, by the initial data? So of course, the easiest thing to do at this stage is to use Sobolev embedding. Okay, that's, the, that's usually people refer to this as the classical method because, well, I don't, okay, because I guess it's the first thing you do. And then, <clears throat> okay, so for Sobolev embedding, you want to control one derivative in L infinity. You're in dimension three, so L infinity costs you uh, uh, three half derivative, three half plus epsilon derivative. So you're in H three half plus epsilon. And because you have one additional derivative, you in H5 half plus epsilon. So this could be, in principle, using sobolev f embedding, be controlled back by the function, uh, by uh, the initial data in HS for S strictly larger than 5 half, okay? You can make this rigorous, and, and then you obtain that you have well-possessed. So the classical method for this scalar nonlinear wave equation gives you well-possessed in S strictly larger than 5 half. And here I should mention that you can do the same procedure for the Einstein equation. Uh, well, there are more details, but basically the idea is exactly the same. Okay? So it, it's a very robust, in other words, it's a very robust method. And in particular, it's a method that works for, you know, I did not specify what is this quadratic nonlinearity. So it's a robust method that works for lots of things. Okay, lots of nonlinearities. I mean, any nonlinearities which is of that type. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yeah, maybe let me do one more. Uh, yeah, well, actually, uh, is, is it fine if we stop now and we start again? If we, because, uh, I mean, it's more logical if to stop here. <laughs> Okay, so in the next hour, we'll see how to go beyond this basic method by using more robust, uh, more advanced methods, sorry. Yeah, sorry, the, I, I noticed uh, that I forgot to tell you uh, just two things I want to tell before I continue. So one, one thing is about uh, the characteristic energy estimate. So let me, sorry, let me just go back one slide uh, because there is something I, I forgot to mention here. So first of all, we, we, uh, 
we won't see this estimate. The characteristic energy estimate will not be relevant to the, the second hour of this lecture. It will be relevant uh, this afternoon. But uh, I still wanted to say something about the, um, the, the sense of this expression here. I, I mean, you, you, may not, you may have noticed that there is something weird. If you have a null hypersurface, the metric is degenerate. And therefore, the volume form does not make sense. So you want, maybe you, you, you might uh, be a bit worried that this does not make sense if you integrate along a null hypersurface. So the point, the point is that uh, if you think in terms of a limit, so the, the point is that there is not only the volume form, there is the normal. And that's what, uh, what saves you in the end. So imagine, for instance, that I have, imagine that I have epsilon strictly positive and that I consider a sequence of space-like hypersurfaces that converge in some sense, let me not be specific, but uh, I'm, I'm, I have space-like hypersurfaces, so this is space-like. This is a sequence of space-like hypersurfaces, and this one is null. Okay, because for space-like, I know what it means, so I just want to take the limit and see if I get something which is meaningful in the end. Okay, so for space-like hypersurfaces, your integral is qt uh, nu epsilon, where nu epsilon is the that's the unit normal to sigma epsilon times the volume, of course, you should not forget that there is the volume of sigma epsilon. And what you can actually show is that, what you, so here you'd like to say, uh, you'd like to look at this limit, does it converge to something? And then if it converge, uh, converge to a limit L, if it converge uh, to limit, uh, yeah, limit, okay? If it converge, you want to call L, if, if L exists, then you'll call L precisely this integral. Uh, sorry, uh, so that's QTL, okay? Okay, so does this limit exist? The, the, the point is that there's not only the volume. Of course, you would make, if you only look at the volume, there's a problem because the volume, obvious, obviously, the metric degenerates, so volume get, the volume element gets to zero. But if you look at this limit, this has a non-trivial limit. Not trivial, non trivial, finite limit. Okay? And this you can easily, to convince yourself, you can easily, I suggest you look at the following simple example. You take, uh, you consider T, okay, so let me, I, always get, I need to get this correctly. So I take epsilon strictly positive, and which is going to go to zero, so it's epsilon strictly positive and much less than one. And I'm considering sigma epsilon, for instance, which is uh, T plus. 1 minus epsilon x3, and then I'm considering, uh, what was the other one? And then in the limit, I'm considering h, which is t plus x3 is equal to 0, which is a null hypersurface. Okay, and if you do this, you will notice that nu epsilon, so the volume element is square root of the determinant of g of the Minkowski uh, metric restricted to uh, sigma epsilon. And here you, you will see that this actually is independent of epsilon because the, the degeneracy of the volume of the metric, of square root of the square root of the determinant of the metric, exactly cancels the degeneracy of the fact that you have a unit normal, and because it degenerates, you have to divide by a quantity which is larger and larger. Okay, so this actually is independent of epsilon. And you get what, what you need in the limit, okay? Uh, okay. So that was one remark. So that's the one remark about the sense of this expression if you have a null hypersurface. And now let me come uh, back also to this transplant on the energy method. I realized that I forgot to, me to tell you what I mean by uh, well, well poseness. So just to make sure that everybody agrees with me, uh, you know, well poseness, what I, what I call well poseness in the nonlinear setting is the existence for all phi not phi. So well poseness is that for all phi 0, phi 1, in HS cross HS minus 1, there exists a st strictly positive time, which of course depends on the initial data, such that there exists, uh, there exists a unique phi, which is continuous with values from 0t to HS, and uh, C1 from 0t to uh, Hs minus 1, sorry. Okay, so that's what I mean by wall poseness. 
Okay, so uh, I remind you that we have seen using the energy method combined with Sobolev embeddings that you obtain well poisonous for a structure larger than 5 half. And since the emphasis here is on low regularity, we'd like to know whether you can improve on the so-called classical method and go below 5 half. And the point is that the main, you know, the crux of the, of the matter is, is, the, is the estimate of this integral here. And you'd like, if you, if you are to, be, to uh, improve on this method in particular, you need to use something that we didn't use, is the integral in time. We use Sobolev embedding, so it's a pointwise in time estimate. And now you'd like to use the integral in time. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you need. Let me not get into that, but yes, you're in, in, in fact, you're, you're right. You also need, it's well posed in the sense of Adamar, so you also need that uh, you, you continuity with respect to initial data. Um, OK, so strict arts estimate. So to go below this exponent, uh, you need to, uh, in, uh, so the, you know, the pro point, the uh, flow of the previous method was that, that was that you didn't exploit the average in time. So now you want to exploit this average in time. And uh, this is uh, best seen by using uh, estimates for the wave equation, which, has called, which are so-called strict arts estimates. So here, let me uh, first say that you will not exploit the full average in time. So in other words, you have to exploit integral from 0 to t of d phi l infinity x. So that corresponds to, that corresponds to l1 in time l infinity in x. So there is. So far, nobody has ever exploited the L1 in time. What you can do instead is use strict arts, which does not provide L1 in time, but rather L2 in time, L infinity in X. Okay, so uh, of course, it's less good than what you have at your disposal, but it's still better that, uh, than the Sobolev embedding, which do use L infinity in time, L infinity in X. Okay, so instead of using L infinity in time, L infinity in X, now you want to use L2 in time, L infinity in X. Okay, and you want to use this to improve on the previous method. So let me remind you what are strict arts estimates in dimension three. And here we'll start with the seminar case. In other words, remember, remind that the seminar case is the case where the, the, the down version here does not depend on a, on a, on a metric which depends on the solution. The, metri the metric here is fixed, it's just Minkowski. So I'm looking at a similar case. In other words, my linear model for this nonlinear equation is just the flat wave equation. Okay, so I'd like to derive strict arts estimates for the flat wave equation. So let me remind you what you get in dimension three. So these, uh, these uh, numbers here are what, what's called strict arts pairs. So you consider a pair PQ such that both P and Q are, are larger or equal to two, and Q is strictly less than plus infinity, and which satisfies the following. You have one over P plus one over Q is less or equal to one half, and R is a number which is equal to three half minus one over P minus three over Q. Okay, uh, and then the solution to the standard wave equation, uh, the version phi is zero and phi, phi dt phi times zero is phi zero phi one, satisfies the following estimate, which is called strict arts, which is phi in LP in time, LQ in X, is controlled by phi zero in HR dot plus phi one in HR minus one dot. So do not pay too much attention on these knots. It's not so important, but it's just, it's the homogeneous version of uh, the solar space. So it's the one where you only control the highest derivative in L2, if you want. not the low frequencies. But anyway, it doesn't really matter for this. Uh, um, OK, but here the important thing is that you get indeed an average in time estimates. Uh, unfortunately, you don't get quite the estimate that you want, because here the estimate which is relevant to this talk is L2, L infinity, and it's precisely the one which is forbidden by this estimate. You see that you want to take P, so you want to take P is equal to 2 and q is equal to plus infinity. So that's what you would like to take. But of course, that's the so-called endpoint strict arts estimate, and it's known to fail in dimension 3. Um, OK, so this endpoint strict arts estimate is simply wrong. You, you cannot have q is plus infinity. Huh? It's just, uh, it's, it, it's known that this is optimal. You cannot have q as plus infinity. However, of course, it doesn't matter. You can just use a little bit more of regularity to go from LP for large p to L infinity by it, you know, taking a little bit of Sobolev regularity. So you just have, in other words, uh, so the one that is wrong, okay, so let me write the estimate that is wrong and let me write the one that is correct.
Okay, so the strict out estimate which is wrong is the uh, is is the following is the end point. So it's phi L2 in time L infinity in X is controlled by phi zero in H1 of R3 plus phi one in H1 of R3. Okay, so that's one, that one is wrong. That's the end point. But, of course, if you just add a little bit of regularity, then it starts being correct. So, L2 in time and infinity in X is controlled. You just need a little bit extra, in other words. Uh, if, if you do like this, you have, a, you, you, you have a log, so you lose a log, so you can add just one plus epsilon. This one is correct. Uh, sorry, that was in L2, of course. So, you, you have to replace H1 by H1 plus epsilon. And L2 by H epsilon. And that's true for any epsilon strictly positive. We have, of course, with a constant which depends on epsilon, they generate epsilon plus zero. Okay, so that's the estimate that's correct, and that's the one we want to use. So uh, this allows you, of course, this is the Strickhardt estimate for the flat wave equation, so this only allows us to tackle the similar case. So again, the similar case is the case where I have the same model problem with the same nonlinearity, which is quadratic with respect to phi. Uh, again, in R1 plus 3 with phi, zero minus, uh, phi times 0 and dt phi is phi 1 at times 0. But now the d'Alembert version does not depend on a, ma a metric which depends on phi itself. It's just a fixed metric, which for simplicity I take to be Minkowski. Okay, so that's the, that's the similar case. Okay, and now uh, I go back to the energy method. I know that I need to control this term. Again, at this stage, you can imagine that you want to control this term with phi, a solution of the flat wave equation. Uh, for simplicity, it's easier to, to understand. And now I just have to use the Strickhardt estimate to control this d phi in L infinity. So I'm going to control the L2 norm. I'm going to use the correct Strickhardt here, not the endpoint, which fails. And with the correct Strickhardt, you see that to control one derivative in L infinity, I need to add one derivative here and there, which, which controls one derivative L2 L infinity by one derivative of phi zero in h1 plus epsilon and one derivative of phi one in h epsilon. And therefore, you, go you, go you need h2 plus epsilon regularity. Okay, so this yields well poseness in h2 plus epsilon. And this, this observation was uh, used by Ponce and Sideris to actually prove that it is indeed well posed in h2 plus epsilon. Okay. Uh, of course, I mean, again, we want to push the regularity as low as possible. And you can, again, ask whether this proof is optimal. And the answer, uh, OK, so let's take, again, my similar problem. And let's try to go even below. And the, the answer is that, actually, this proof is optimal in general. OK, there's a, there are explicit counterexample of Lindblad, which tell you that this equation is L posed in H2. OK, so you are able to prove H2 plus epsilon, but the result is wrong in H2. Uh, let me give you a basic, uh, one basic example treated by Lindblad, usually the, the, the most basic one. When you try to look for problems for this type of equation, the equation you always look for is this one. And maybe with what I said later on, it becomes clear why this one is the problematic one. Okay, so that's the easiest type, type of non narrative which is problematic. I look at Dallon version phi is dt phi square. Okay? So this one is imposed in H2. Okay, so that's imposed. So that's one example. That's imposed in H2. OK, so uh, well, but of course, that doesn't mean that it's always true. I mean, it, it means that uh, it's certainly wrong in general. But maybe if you, add, if you take specific nonlinearities, it's going to uh, suddenly uh, uh, become true. OK, so um, you can actually work very simple example where, where explicit. I mean, there are explicit examples where you see that, indeed, you can go even below because there are some structure where you can change, make a change of variable and reduce this to a linear equation. Um, so certainly, you can go below uh, for some cases. And, uh, and this special structure that you have to ask is, is what is the so-called null structure, which I already mentioned in this talk. So this null structure, uh, it's a terminology introduced by, by Kleinerman in the 80s when he looked at global existence and small data for uh, quasi-linear wave equations. 
And it turns out to be also very relevant to the issue of regularity. Uh, the same structure, this null structure, and he uh, also uh, um, discovered in his work with Macedon in the, in, the, in the 90s that it is also relevant to the, the issue of regularity and pushing for low regularity well -possedness. Okay, so uh, it turns out that with this special null structure, it's possible to go beyond S uh, strictly larger than 2. And let me give one example of this null structure. So there are, it's, these, these quadratic nullities are called null form. There are several of them. Let me only give you the one which is relevant to this talk. That's this QIJ form. You can see that it has a very special null st structure. So it's QIJ of phi psi. So it's, a, it's, some, it's supposed to be quadratic in first order derivative. So it's QIJ of phi psi. It's di phi dj psi minus di psi dj phi. Okay. Um, so there are other terms, types of null forms. So here, of course, men, uh, uh, notice that this does not make sense for a scalar equation. For a scalar equation, it's atomically zero. So it's not very interesting. But we'll have to deal with systems. So for us, it will, it will be relevant. Uh, but anyway, that's the one, that's the null form we'll see all the time in, in these lectures. And um, they have a certain cancellation. I mean, the, the point is that what you want to uh, avoid is what is so-called parallel interactions. It's a wave interacting with itself. Two, wa two wave packets going in the same direction because then they interact with themselves for a long time. You'd like to have wave packets going in different directions. Okay, so when you, when you have wave packets for the wave equation, they propagate. The wave equation propagates along the light cone. And the light cone has this feature that it expands, that is, you know, different directions, they, they interact for very little time in principle. But if they are in the same direction, if they are along the same direction along the cone, they will interact for a very long time, and that's an issue, okay? That's an issue both for global existence for small data and for low regularity, okay? And these null forms have the feature to avoid this parallel interaction. They kill the waves that are parallel, okay? So, you, I mean, you can see that there is, you can imagine by the form of this that there is a, a cancellation going on, and you can actually see also that definitely with this nonlinearity DT, DT phi square, there is no uh, there is obviously no conciliation, which you can see here. I mean, I mean, at least visually, you can imagine there is no conciliation. Okay, so here, there is a specific conciliation, which is very important. Okay, so now that tells you that there are special nonlinearities, and uh, of course, next, what you have to do is how to exploit this structure, okay? It's not only nice to have a nice structure, you need to be able to exploit it. So in analysis, it means what is the right estimate for this, and the right estimate to exploit this structure are so-called bilinear estimates. Okay, so bilinear estimates, I'll be, uh, um, I'll be very specific in the second lecture, and I actually proved these bilinear estimates. At least I'll give you the ideas to prove them. Uh, even in a curved background, not a flat one. So here it's just for the flat background. So for now, let me just explain what I mean. Uh, let's say a bit philo philosophically by binary estimate, but let me not write them for, for now, okay? Uh, so what I mean by binary estimate is the following. Well, let me first tell you what I mean by linear estimate, and then you understand what is a binary estimate. So what is a linear estimate? So for n let's, let me try. So what is it that you have to control? Uh, so you want to control d phi, d psi, and you want to control it in L2 spacetime. So L2 tx of R1 plus 3. Okay, so that's my quadratic nonlinearity, and I want to control it L2 in spacetime. So what is a linear estimate? A linear estimate uh, is simply taking this product and breaking it I have the norm of the product, and I break it in the product of the norms. Okay, so I, I get this. Uh, so for instance, I would take uh, 1 to be L infinity in T, L2 in X. I mean, that's one example. I mean, of course, you can do something else. But, but uh, the main point here is I'm breaking a product, uh, norm of the product in product of the norm. Okay? Okay, and now, of course, and then uh, this, you would use the energy estimate. And here, you would use trickouts. So in other words, I call this a linear estimate because once you br you've broken the product, uh, the norm of the product and product of the norm, then you do a linear estimate. That is, you do, you assume, for instance, that this is solution of linear wave action, you do an estimate for this one. You assume that this is solution of linear equation, you do an estimate for this one. So these are linear estimates. These are linear, you know, at this stage, it's a linear estimate. Okay? So why? Uh, so that's a linear estimate. So that's, uh, that's linear estimate. So this is a linear estimate. Uh, 
So why is it clearly wrong? That, well, for one thing, it's wrong because we know that the three cards estimates cannot be, you, you're controlling something which is at the level of H1 uh, and the, I mean, uh, sorry, at the level of H2. I mean, we know that we will lose epsilon with the three cards estimates, but more, to, more importantly here, this cannot work because I'm not using the structure of the equation. A linear estimate is the same whatever the structure of the product. I have a product, I break the product, the, the norm of the product and product of the norm. If I break it, I lose the structure. So I already know it's wrong because I, I told you that in general, it's optimal. It's so, you can only go below H2 plus epsilon because you use the structure of the nonlinearity. So you will never make it with a linear estimate simply because the linear estimate does not see the structure. So a binding estimate for now is just something that does not do this. Okay, the binding estimate is something that really estimates the norm of the, of the binding expression and does not break in products of the norm. Okay? For now, let me keep this definition. And, and we'll see later on uh, how, you, how you do it. In, in, in the second lecture, I'll, I actually state some binding estimates and, pro and prove some of them. Uh, and we'll see that uh, you proceed very differently. Anyway, okay, so it turns out that uh, you, can, you can actually prove these binary estimates uh, once you have the good structure, these for null forms. And in particular, there's a result of Kleinman and Macadon from uh, 93 or 94, I forget, which proves well-posedness for S strictly larger than 3 half, okay? And, and for that equation, it turns out actually to be, to be optimal, okay? So in other words, but the only thing to remember is that if you go, you are able to go belong, beyond this ex exponent given by the Strickers method, uh, provided you have more structure and provided you use binding estimates, okay? Okay, so now uh, let me go back to Poisson-Yar wave equation because that is the model which is relevant to the Einstein equation. So now I'm back with, my, with having a down version depending on the metric which depends on the solution itself. So that's what we call the Poisson-Yar case. And I'm asking the same question of well poseness so first of all, remember that the energy method with sublime embedding, I mean the so-called classical method, is very robust and it works both for seminar and quasi-linear equation. So we already know you are well posed uh, for S strictly larger than 5 half. And now you want to try to go beyond 5 half. And in view of the seminar case, the way you do this is by using strict arts. And uh, the first difficulty you have to face is that now you don't use the strict arts estimates for the flat wave equation. Uh, but you have to prove Strickard estimates for down version G of phi is zero, where G uh, is not only a curved background, but it's also a curved background with very little regularity, simply because you're trying to apply this with your metric G, which depends on phi itself. So if phi has little regularity, G has little regularity. In particular, if G, uh, if phi is below phi half plus epsilon, phi half plus epsilon is Lipschitz regularity for phi. So if you're going below Lipschitz regularity for phi, it means that here you have to prove a Strickard with G, which is not even Lipschitz. Yeah, so that's a very, very weak assumption. <coughs> and also the other problem is that basically the, the proof of strict estimates for the flat wave equation rely heavily on the fact that you can take Fourier transform. So that, yeah, you have to do a whole different proof, of course. Anyway, so you have to prove this. And the first result in this direction was by Hart Smith, uh, who showed that it's possible to prove them in the framework of G in uh, C11. So essentially, that means G is C21. Which is, uh, I mean, it is, uh, it's because C differentiate here. I mean, there are different assumptions uh, with respect to space and time derivative, but that means G is C2, basically. OK? Uh, or one derivative of G in L infinity here. Uh, two derivative of G in infinity. OK, so here, not only he does show this result, but he shows that it's optimal. Okay? And that's a very bad news, because uh, again, we are trying to having a metric which is not even Lipschitz, and he tells you you need a metric to be C2. But the twist here is that in his work, he insists of having the exact same strict cards as for the wave equation. And <clears throat> the breakthrough uh, made by Bao and Chemin was to realize that actually, if you want to go below 5 half, you don't need to have the exact optimal strict cards of the flat wave, of the flat case. It's enough to have a strict cards with a loss. As long as you do better at the classical method, you can allow a loss, you still will be uh, below. OK, and, and this idea was used uh, by Bao and Chemin to uh, go uh, down one quarter from five half, they went to two plus one quarter. Okay, so they gained one quarter with respect to the classical method with this idea. Then there was a whole sequence of works to try to push to the optimal exponent with the Strickard's method. So there are names associated to it, uh, Bowie Chemin, Tataru, um, Kleinman Rodiansky, and finally the optimal exponent was reached by <coughs> 
uh, which is uh, S strictly larger than 2 for the Strickert's method, was, was reached by Kahneman and Rodionsky for the Einstein equation and Smith Tataru for quasi general quasi linear wave equation. Okay, so le let me not get into that because <coughs> it's not the part I'm going to use, but I just wanted to, to mention this. And here, uh, Again, let me mention that this, again, is the optimal exponent you can reach with the, with the Strickart's method. Okay, so within using Strickart's estimates, these results are optimal. Okay, so now uh, we want, in this uh, lecture, we'll go actually below this exponent uh, strictly larger than 2 for the Einstein equation. So let me, uh, again, uh, remind you from the similar case, we have learned two things. The first thing is that uh, this equation, even for similar cases, is ill-posed Ill Ill in general in H2, because there is this uh, specific other example I gave here on the blackboard. Uh, the dimension phi is phi t squared. So, of course, in the quasi case, case, it's also true that uh, it's ill-posed in general. Um, but recall that if the nonality has a special structure called the null structure, it's, pos it's actually possible to go below uh, H2 plus epsilon in the similar case. So, you'd like to do the same in a quasi-linear situation, but of course, one, the first thing you're the first difficulty you have is what is this nonlinear structure? What is this null structure, in other words? And here I'd like to uh, point out that, um, uh, well, even if you don't know what it is, provided you start with interesting geometrical hyperbolic equation, they should satisfy the null structure. I mean, from the cellular case, we know that every interesting geometric hyperbolic equation, such as wave map, I mean, the one coming from physics, in other words, such as wave map, uh, Maxwell, Klein, Gordon, or, um, or Young Mills, they all satisfy the, the null structure. So we believe that if you have a nice, interesting geometric hyperbolic equation coming from physics, it should satisfy the null structure. And of course, the main candidate in the quasi linear setting are the ancient equations. Okay? So here, you start with the belief that for the ancient equation, you should do, be able to do better than this result of Klein and, and Rodiansky in H2 plus epsilon. And here, the goal of this lecture will be to, ex to explain how you can prove that the ancient expression actually are well posed at the level of H2. So here, let me uh, remind you that um, I, uh, I, uh, uh, no, uh, I mean, the, in, in the title, you saw that it's about bounded L2 curvature. So you have the curvature tensor, which is bounded in L2. So the curvature tensor, so what is the relation with this, with this H2 exponent here? The relation is that the curvature tensor uh, in a coordinate system so, I, I mean, uh, again, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but I just want to make the relation between uh, the title of the lecture and, and this, uh, this goal, which seems to be different here, which is Einstein equation of in H2. The point is that in a coordinate system, the curvature tensor, so let me call R, this capital R, the curvature tensor of my space-time, the curvature tensor of the space-time in a coordinate system is an expression involving two derivatives of the metric plus derivative of the metric square. So in particular, you see that if the curvature tensor is in L2, that means that two derivatives of the metric is in L2, or at least a specific combination. And two derivatives of G in L2 is, uh, uh, is, it, uh, you know, is, is at the same level of regularity as that, that G is in, in H2, right? The sublevel space H2 is two derivatives in L2. Okay? So it, it's indeed, it's just you know, a more geometric way it's a more geometric theorem which tells you about curvature in L2, but in essence, it means well, Einstein equation are well in H2. That's what you want to do. Okay, so uh, before doing this, so uh, this will be the, the main focus of the, I mean, the statement of this, and, and I'll give statement of these motivations and, and first an overview of the proof in the next lecture. But for now, let me finish this lecture with giving you a simple model problem which is very relevant to this. So I'd like to take a semilinear equation, which is as close as possible to Einstein, to the Einstein equation, which, is, which are quasi-linear, and work out this problem in detail so that you can uh, uh, have a feeling for what we're going to do in the next lecture. Okay? So it turns out that the semilinear model, which is the, the right one, are classical Young Mills equation. That's the, that's the semilinear model, which is as close as possible to the Einstein equation in some sense, at least for what I'm going to talk about. Okay? So let me remind you what our classical Young Mills equation. Uh, so here, of course, as usual, I'm going to consider them in R3 to make an analogy with the Einstein equations. Uh, so if you don't know anything about Young Mills, it doesn't matter. So here, I'd like to point out that, again that this is classical Young Mills. It's not quantum Young Mills. Uh, you probably have heard about quantum Young Mills. Uh, 
maybe in the literature uh, of Christian Gérard, but here this is classically on Mills. It's, it's much easier. So you take a connection A. So you take a connection one form from, so here I'm going to set Young Mills on, uh, on, uh, on the Minkowski space time. Uh, it's easier to see the analogy. So you take a connection one form on the Minkowski space time, which takes value in a Lie algebra of a compact clip loop. Okay, that's the, that's the make framework. And here, to fix, uh, to fix the ideas, let me take the, the Lie algebra which I'm interested in, which are anti-symmetric matrices. Because that's, actually what will happen is that we will realize the ancient equation as a quasi-near version of the Young Mills equation and the corresponding uh, uh, Lie algebra will be precisely anti-symmetric matrices, so uh, little s031. Okay, so in other words, you so you have a connection one form of, of our one of, of, on our one plus three. So of course, the connection one form consists of four components: uh, a alpha, d, dx alpha. So it's a alpha, dx alpha, and I'm, I'm denoting these components by a zero, e one, e two, e three. And all these a alpha. They go from the Minkowski spacetime, so they go from R1 plus 3 to the algebra of anti-symmetric matrices, so SO31. Okay. Okay. Uh, so here, you. So what is this connection? So this connection one form is related to uh, a curvature, which is defined. So the curvature of the connection is defined as follows. So you have F alpha beta is d alpha a minus d, d, d alpha a beta minus d beta a alpha minus, and here. <coughs> it's the Lie bracket of A alpha A beta. So here, <coughs> it's the Lie bracket of your algebra. So for us, uh, it's the Lie bracket associated to anti-symmetric matrices. So it's a product. It's an anti-symmetric product of, of the matrices. Uh, OK, so the classical Young-Mills equation, uh, are, uh, it's the critical point of the falling Lagrangian. So you integrate of R1 plus 3 on the Minkowski spacetime. So that's the volume element of the Minkowski spacetime. Uh, you integrate f alpha beta up, f alpha beta down, so you contract f with itself. And here, the indices are raised with the Minkowski metric, this is on Minkowski. And if you look at the corresponding Euler Lagrange equation of, the, of, of this uh, equation, uh, so here I'd like to write it in terms of the potential vector, of the, uh, co sorry, connection one form A, because it's, it's easier to see. So in terms of the connection one form, this is the equation that you see. You see Dalambertian of your connection one form, so Dalambertian of A, so here's, here, Again, this is sublinear. You see it at this level because it's the flat down version. So this is where you see it's sublinear. So down version of A plus space-time gradient of the space-time divergence of A is equal to the Lie bracket of A times the gradient of A plus A cube. So here, let me uh, do several remarks about this equation. First of all, uh, you have you have uh, here you have a nice wave equation. Here, this is not so nice. This gradient of uh, space and gradient of space and divergence. Uh, uh, we'll see that this is related to the gauge invariance of the equation. So that's why you have, you know, you don't have a nice type. This is related to gauge invariance. Uh, and then here, you have the quadratic terms. And as we have said, the quadratic terms are very important. They need to have the null structure. So you can see already, even if I did not show you the null structure, at this stage, you see that there is a very special structure. Maybe it's not yet null, but at least it's, it's a special structure because it involves this Lie bracket. And Lie bracket means you know, anti-symmetric things. So you, you can expect already to have some cancellations. And then you have the cubic term. And here, really, whenever you see a cubic term, uh, just forget about it in this talk. Cubic terms are low order. In other words, you can treat them just by sobolev embeddings. OK, I'm simply using the embedding of H1 in L6. That gives me the cubic term in L2, and, and, and that's it. So cubic terms are irrelevant. What I want to focus about are, on one hand, this dangerous term here related to gauge invariance. On the other hand, I'd like to focus on this uh, bracket here, on this quadratic term. Uh, we're going to fix the gauge. Sorry? No, the cubic term. So, sorry, uh, I'm confused. The cubic term, I mean, the, you have cubic terms coming from the fact that uh, if you look at the, I mean, if you look at the earlier Lagrange of this stuff, you have, you have these terms, d, d, a, d alpha a, d alpha b, and then you have these uh, quadratic terms here. Okay, so that's where the, the cubic term emerges. It's when you, okay, so let me think, how does it work? Um, sorry? Yeah. 
Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Uh, okay, let me, I, I just don't, uh, I didn't do this in a long time, but I guess if you, if you plug this and you look for the earlier Lagrange, you have to integrate by part once. So when you integrate by part once, this is the second order relative, so this will give you either this term or this term. And then, uh, then you get about, well, it just, so it's here, right? You will have a product of this times the product uh, of the other one. So when you look at the variation of this, you will have A alpha A beta and another Lie bracket with, let's say, uh, uh, another Lie bracket with A. And, the and if you do the variation with respect to the last guy, we'll have H times A times A times A if H is your variation. And that will give you the cubic term, right? OK. So here is my equation. And now I'd like to investigate again this issue of local well poseness. So here, I'll review the proof of Kleinman Macedon of well poseness of Young Mills uh, in the energy space. So the energy space, so first of all, uh, let me tell you that you have an energy. Okay, so for young mills, you have an energy. All right, so let's call me E of F of T. That's the integral of R1 plus 3 of F square dt dx. Okay, so this is conserved. And you can see that this level, this energy is at level. So this, the energy, energy, so energy space, if you want the energy space, energy space is at the level of F, is at the level of F in L2. Uh, it's at the level of F in L2, which is because F, but now remember that the curvature is of the form, so F alpha beta is D alpha A, D beta minus D beta A, D alpha uh, plus A alpha A beta. No, sorry, minus A alpha A beta. Okay, so you see that curvature in L2 means conne uh, connection one form in H1, right? So this is at the level of DA in L2. So this is at the level of A in H1. OK, so it seems logical. Uh, so the energy space is A in H1. Uh, so let me also comment on the, the relation between this particular well possessed result and what we are trying to do. Okay, so that's a proof of Kleinman and McKinnon from 95. Uh, they prove actually global well possessedness in H1. Uh, but let me first comment why uh, H1 is relevant to our problem. Okay, so here in our problem, we are trying to investigate for the Einstein equation, the analogy is the following. For the Einstein equation, I'd like to control the curvature in L2. But the curvature in L2, as we've seen uh, here, you have curvature in L2. Okay, so this, the connection is that you're trying to control the curvature in L2 in both cases, and, and actually this analogy will, uh, will be very relevant. Okay? So that the analogy is that, indeed, this uh, well possessedness of a young mills in H1 turns out to be exactly equivalent to curvature in L2 for the ancient equation. Okay? So it's, it's the correct, if you want, uh, uh, for now it seems to be the correct analog, uh, similar analog of what we're trying to do in the quasi case for the ancient equation. Okay? So that's why H1. Let me also mention maybe uh, 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 a first motivation for looking at rough uh, local well business result for, for nonlinear uh, wave equation and, and, in part, and more generally for nonlinear evolution PDE, you can see already a first application because you are able to prove well business in H1 in the energy space. So, first of all, that's a rough well business okay, uh, result. As we will see, you need byline estimates. So, it's a rough well business because if you do the classical method, you would reach uh, actually H3 half in that setting and you would reach a H1 plus epsilon with strikeouts. So here, it's a rough wet business because you do need to reuse the structure and use byline estimates, as we will see in, in the end of the slide, towards the end of the slide. But here, uh, you have a first motivation. I mean, I, I'll give uh, more motivations in connection to the Einstein equation, but already, uh, as far as nonlinear wave equations are concerned, you can see that because you're able to prove well poseness at the level of H1, which is a rough well poseness data, you automatically get, get global well poseness because you have a conserved energy. Okay, so in other words, you get a, a local, time, local in time existence result which tells you that the solution is controlled by H1, but still H, since H1 is concerned, you keep piling up the same time of existence until you get global existence. Okay, so it's, a, it's probably the first, it's the first application of uh, why uh, um, 
rough data, local existence result is important for evolution PDEs. Of course, for us in Einstein equation, it will be different, uh, different uh, motivation simply because there is no concept quantity. Okay, but you know, that's the first motivation for looking at this type of results. Okay, so uh, let me remind you that this is the equation, and now we want to prove well possessing H1. And again, as, as it is, I cannot start unless I kill this term here, which is related to uh, the gauge invariance of the young meals. So there is a gauge freedom. And here I'd like to pick uh, uh, a very usual gauge for young meals, which is the, the Coulomb gauge. Okay. So I'm picking the Coulomb gauge. Of course, I'm doing this because, I mean, first I'm doing this because that's the original proof of Carolyn and Macedon, but I'm also doing this because that's the correct analog of what we'll do in, 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 for the Einstein equations. So you pick a Coulomb gauge, and if you pick the Coulomb gauge, you see that this transforms your equations uh, uh, as follows, right? You have a space-time divergence, but now the space divergence is zero, so out of the space-time divergence, you just keep the d0 is zero term. So, okay, of course, it's not totally killed, but already it, it's simpler. And uh, again, let's, not, let's forget about the cubic term, which is low order, but let's focus both on this term on the right-hand side, which is the space-time gradient of d0 is zero, and on the right-hand side, I have this quadratic term with a special structure, but it's not yet a null structure, uh, the null structure. So I need to do two things at the same time. I'd like to do two things at the same time. I'd like to kill this term once and for all, and I'd like to, to uh, uncover the null structure. In some sense, the null structure is a bit hidden. There is structure, but I don't see yet my, my favorite null form QIJ. So I'd like to uncover the null structure and at the same time kill this term here. So the way you do this is by rem rem reminding that you have the the Coulomb gauge, which allows you in particular to say that because you're divergence-free, I can project on divergence-free vector fields without losing any information. So I'd like to project on divergence-free vector fields. So P is the project on divergence-free vector fields, of course, in space, right? I have space divergence. So it's the projector on divergence-free divergence vector fields in space you know, with respect to space variables. So what's, what's happening when you do this? Well, you get two types of, uh, yeah, well, let me... So if I separate between space variables and time variables, so in other words, if I separate between, uh, yeah, let me do this. I mean, it's all, uh, okay, this one does not go up. Okay, sure. I'm going to get used to it at some point. Okay, so uh, you, have, you have the following. So you have, let, let me uh, decompose this as a zero, uh, sorry, a, uh, yeah, well, uh, how do you know? a zero, it's one form, and then I want to call it, let, let me call this a bar, where a bar is just the special part. So it's a1, a2, a3. So what is it that I see? I see, on the one hand, I see dimension a zero plus d zero of, plus d zero square a zero, is equal to blah blah, and on the other hand, I see Dalon version of a bar plus space gradient of a bar is equal to blah blah. Okay, so if I project, so first of all, if I project on divergence free vector field, it's for the second one, it's for the a bar. The first one, I don't do anything, but it turns out that you don't have to do anything anyway because here, remember, this guy is minus d0 square or dt square if you want plus Laplacian, so this cancels with this. And you automatically get Laplace and A0 is whatever. In other words, I get an elliptic equation. And here I'm happy enough because elliptic uh, is always better in terms of regulating. Okay. So here, let me forget about this, this A0. This A0 will behave better because elliptic equation automatically gains two equations as opposed to the wave equation, which only gains one. Okay. So this, this will be much better in terms of regulating. I, I mean, Maybe, maybe not much better, but this is, it's going to be better. And therefore, the main focus is this one. So here, if I project on divergence free vector field, I get, first of all, the projector commutes with the wave operator. So I get this plus, and here I'm projecting on divergence free vector field, but of course, projecting divergence free vector field kills the gradient. So this is zero, right? So you, in the end, you get the version of P A bar is equal to blah, blah. But of course, PA bar, because A is the divergence free, PA bar is equal to A bar, actually. OK? So in the end, you get the following system. You get an elliptic system, which I'm not going to talk about, because you know, it, it's in terms of regularity, which is the concern here, it's better, because elliptic systems gain two derivatives uh, as opposed to wave equation. And here, I have a system of three, wave three coupled wave equation. 
And here you can see that once I get P, once I apply P to this Lie bracket here, you actually are able to see the null form. In other words, I'm start seeing this QIJ. Uh, sorry, well, here my notation is QJL. But, yeah. So it's Q, you st start seeing this QJL null form. Uh, here I should mention that it's only after taking the projection that you see the QJL null form. Okay? Before taking the projection, you don't see the null structure, it's hidden. Okay, but you know, picking a gauge allows you to encode this. So you project on the spherical field, you see these null forms. You see here you have two types of null forms, D minus one AA and uh, QJ of D minus one AA and D minus one of QJL AA. Well, so let's not worry about this green minus one. Just imagine that I'm gaining a derivative, doesn't matter how. It's actually through a difficult system. Okay, because I project on the three vector field, it's through a difficult system, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so now what you want to do next? Well, you want to control the connection in H1, so that corresponds to just running the energy estimate without even commuting the derivatives. I want to run the energy estimate. So I run the energy estimate for the wave equation. The energy estimate controls me first order derivative of my connection in L infinity in time L2, that's the energy estimate. And on the right hand side, I have to estimate the L2 norm space time of my right hand side. So in, uh, let me drop the lower order term and I get the L2 norm space time of my two null forms, okay? I mean, uh, my two uh, null terms, okay? And now this is where you use binary estimate again. At this stage, it turns out that strict arts estimate, you will, you, you will lose an epsilon here. So if you are to close this, you, you have to use this null structure, and therefore you have to rely on, the so, on these so-called binary estimates. And once you do this, you actually conclude the proof. Okay. So let me uh, maybe review uh, what are the, the steps, because the, uh, I want to emphasize them, because that's essentially that will be a guideline for us. In the non, in, I mean, in the, for the actual equation, this would be a guideline. So I'd like to, to emphasize these steps. Okay, so the first step is the following. The first thing you do is, so first, there is one step, well, actually, there are several steps which are hidden. This is because you're in a flat case. Because you're in a flat case, there are several steps here that probably you even didn't realize there were steps because it's totally automatic in the flat case. But I'd like to still stress them out because in the curve case, in particular for the Einstein equation, they will be highly non-trivial. So a, a first, a first thing that you probably didn't notice is the fact that at first you start with a tensorial wave equation. You have the wave operator applied to A, A is a one form. So a tensorial wave, and then I end up with having four scalar equations. Okay, so this is, in general, this is highly non-trivial. Of course, in the flat case, it's totally <coughs> trivial because there is no difference between a tensorial wave equation and four scalar equations. Okay, but in the curve case, it's going to be different. So this step, I'd like to call it scalarization. So you scalarize, the first thing you do is you scalarize the tensorial wave equation. Again, here, it's hidden by the fact that in the, in the flat case, there is absolutely no difference between tensorial wave equation and scalar wave equation for one form. The second step is uh, the projection. You project on divergent three vector field. So again, when we, uh, of course, again, this step is totally trivial here simply because the projector on divergent three vector field commutes with the d'Alembertian in Minkowski space time. Okay? But of course, in the curve case, it's, uh, this is no more true, right? When you, when you look at the, uh, when you look at the commutation between the, the d'Alembertian and the projection on divergent three vector field, you, you get something highly non trivial again. Okay, then there is a third step, which uh, again is, um, well, okay. Uh, a third step, which is totally uh, uh, trivial here, it's the energy estimate, right? You you do the you run the energy estimate. The energy estimate, obviously, in the flat case, uh, I mean, it's, it's it's immediate. So here you have the energy estimate, but of course, in the curve case, there will be. In other words, in the curve case, what will happen is that there will be an extra term from the fact that you're not in Minkowski. So your vec your your time-like vector field which you contract with is not killing, so that will give you an additional term, which we saw later on, uh, earlier on, which was this uh, term involving the deformation tensor of T. So that additional term will be 
uh, dangerous, but here, of course, in this case, the energy estimate is immediate. And finally, uh, you have the buying estimates. And of course, again, in the curve case, through, I mean, proving by an estimate in the flat case, the proof is essentially totally Fourier based. So you have to abandon it and get a different proof in the quasi linear situation um, because you're in the curve case. Okay, so what we'll have to do is, in, I mean, this gives us a guideline of what we'll see this afternoon. Uh, basically, this afternoon we'll see all these steps, and, uh, but we'll have to perform in the quasi linear setting, and again, they'll, they'll become highly non trivial. Okay, so uh, since I have five more minutes, let me, uh, probably maybe in 10, uh, let me uh, finish this by uh, presenting uh, the, the Cauchy problem for the Einstein equation, and then this afternoon we'll, we'll, we'll be able to start with talking about uh, the statement uh, of the theorem, motivations, and the overview of the proof. Okay, but, but again, this, this, these are the steps that we want to, I mean, this is the guideline of the proof uh, of what we'll see this afternoon. Okay, so let me uh, finish by reviewing the Cauchy problem for the Einstein equation. So again, I'm taking uh, a Lorentzian manifold, uh, mg. Uh, R uh, is the curvature tensor of, uh, I'm going to denote by bold R as usual, the curvature tensor of my Lorentzian metric. So here, in all what I'm saying, uh, well, you probably heard a lot about uh, the k space time in the lecture of last, but here, again, the only example uh, which is relevant to this talk is actually, to these lectures, is actually the Minkowski space time. Okay, that's the, that's the main example you, you should have in, in, in mind. I mean, oh, I lost another one. Okay. It's the main example you should have in mind uh, in this lecture. And here, this curvature tensor, it's a four tensor, right? I should maybe write once and for all. So the curvature tensor of a metric be it uh, Riemannian or Lorentzian, here we're in Lorentzian setting, but it's the same in Riemannian setting. The Lorentzian, the curvature tensor is a four tensor, so let me decode it by R, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So it's a four tensor for all values of the indices. And then you can contract this four tensor and get the Ricci tensor. So you have Ricci, alpha, beta. Ricci, alpha, beta is simply the contraction, you contract the first and the third in this uh, index, so it's R, alpha, beta, uh, sorry, no. So let me write it well. Rich, Rick of uh, mu nu. Rick of mu nu is alpha mu alpha nu. So you contract the third and uh, the first and the third indices. That gives you a two tensor. So that's a four tensor. And out of it, you get Ricci, which is a symmetric two tensor. Okay, so now let me uh, talk about the degrees of freedom. So in other words, the, the RIC is a kind of trace of the curvature tensor, which encodes only partial information of the curvature. Okay, the curvature tensor encodes all the information of the curvature of, of your space-time. The Ricci tensor encodes only a partial information. So let me be more specific uh, about the, the degrees of freedom and the norm, I mean, in, in the, uh, about the number, sorry, about the number of information that is encoded by the curvature tensor. So the curvature tensor is a four tensor. Uh, so in particular, you would think in principle that it encodes four at the power four information, which is 64 degrees of freedom. But because of symmetries, it has a large number of symmetries. And we'll talk in particular about the Bianchi identities, which will be uh, essential to, to these lectures. So uh, we'll see later on what, the, what these are. Actually, it's the second Bianchi identity, which will be relevant. But you have lots of symmetries of this curvature tensor, and because of these symmetries, then uh, you, say, you see that you have 20 degrees of freedom. Out of the 64 possible, you only have 20 degrees of freedom. Okay, now because the Ricci tensor is a symmetric two tensor, then because it's a symmetric two tensor, you have, and you're in dimension four, you have 10, uh, okay, so it's 10 n plus one divided by two, so you have, uh, exactly uh, 20 divided by 2, so that's 10 degrees of freedom, okay? That's the degrees of freedom of a symmetric matrix in dimension 4, so you have 10 degrees of freedom. Okay, so you see that the Ricci tensor actually encodes only half 
of the information, and you have still the other half, which you have to recover, and the Einstein vacuum equation. So here I will only talk about the Einstein vacuum equations, that is, in, in particular, the, uh, and these equations uh, correspond to a vanishing Ricci tensor. So a vanishing Ricci tensor that, that gives you 10 equations because you have 10 degrees of freedom, and uh, so you have 10, uh, you prescribe 10 components, I mean 10 degrees of freedom to vanish, and you still have 10 degrees of freedom left. Okay, so in other words, this is dynamical equation because you only prescribe half of degrees of freedom possible. You still need, you still have the freedom associated to the t 10 other degrees of freedom, okay? So here, again, uh, one comment. I'm only going to talk about the Einstein vacuum equation in these lectures. So the general Einstein equation will have a right-hand side, uh, T alpha beta here, which corresponds to the uh, energy momentum, momentum tensor of your space-time, so the contribution uh, the contribution to the curvature of the space-time given by the matter, matter fields and energy, but here let me just consider the vacuum, which is already uh, very interesting by itself, okay? So that's the equation for the rest of the lecture. It's Ricci, Rick alpha beta is equal to zero. So it's a very nice and compact geometric equation, uh, but in that form it's not so obvious that it's an evolution problem. So let me give you a formulation, a very easy formulation of the problem, where you immediately see that you have to deal with an evolution problem, and we also, that will justify the model problem I, I used in the, in the beginning of the, the I mean, uh, in, in the lecture so far, this uh, nonlinear wave equations. Okay, so I'd like to, so, uh, I'd like to pick a specific, again, here you have gauge invariance, and that's why it's hard to see what's, what's happening. And here the gauge invariance is the freedom to pick any coordinate system, or you, or you can even be a bit more general than that, but for now, let me say that there is the freedom to pick any coordinate system of your equation. This, the Ricci tensor, does not depend on, on the choice of coordinate system, so I, can, I am free to pick any coordinate system I want. And I like to pick a very simple coordinate system, which are called wave coordinates. And that's the equivalent of how many coordinates in Riemannian geometry, if you're more, more familiar. Okay, so I like to pick wave coordinates. So the wave coordinates, are, I have four coordinates because in, I'm in dimension four, I have x0, x1, x2, x3, and I'm picking direction g of x alpha is one over square root of the determinant of g, d beta, g beta gamma square root of the determinant g d gamma, x alpha is equal to zero. And I recall that this is the expression in coordinates of my uh, covariant wave operator in the matrix G. Okay, so in these coordinates, this is the expression that you get, and you apply it, you're asking that your coordinates themselves satisfies box G of x alpha is equal to zero. And in this coordinate system, you can express, so first of all, you can always express the Ricci tensor in, in a coordinate system, but in this special coordinate system, there are some terms that you kill, which corresponds to the, you know, the bad terms in the young mills. In the young mills, I had this, uh, I had also some bad terms due to, to gauge freedom. So you kill these bad terms, and in the end, you get a very clean, a very clean equation. So it turns out that the second-order derivative of your metric, which appear naturally in the Ricci tensor, they all end up to be wave equations. So you end up to ha of having a system of nonlinear wave equations in the coefficients of the metric G alpha beta. So because G alpha beta um, is a symmetric uh, tensor, two tensor, you get 10, actually 10 equations in dimension four, which corresponds to the fact that we've seen there are still 10 degrees of freedom. So you get 10, a system of 10 wave equations, nonlinear wave equations. And you can see that if you think in terms of scalar wave equation, this is exactly the form that I've been talking about. In other words, it's quasi-linear because it depends on the metric. The metric is a function on the solution itself because uh, it's actually the metric here, the dimension in the metric. So this is a quasi-linear problem because you're nonlinear even in the highest order derivatives. And furthermore, your nonlinearity on the right hand side, the semilinear part of the nonlinearity is quadratic with respect to DG. Okay, so it's exactly the same problem uh, we've been dealing, except now you have a system. Um, you have a system, and then th there's also this business with the gauge choice. Okay, so that's the. Okay, so here let me also. Uh, mentioned that I'm only using these coordinates for the purpose of uh, giving you a simple expression of the ancient equation uh, so that you can check that we did talk about the quadratic model problem, but they will be, these coordinates will be totally irrelevant for, the, for this talk. It's just, it's just for this slide that I'm using them, but they, they will play no part in this role, and actually they are precisely known to be w uh, bad behave for what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so here, uh, at least you can see that you have to deal with wave equations, and clearly, the Cauchy data, as we've seen, should consist. I keep using my, chart. my my Cauchy data should consist of. Um, well, basically, it should consist of. G, so let me write it here. 
clearly my Cauchy data, in view of the fact that I have wave equations, it should consist of the following. It should consist of G, prescribing G at time zero, and prescribing um, DTG at time zero, okay? So that should be my Cauchy data, but of course I want, that's a coordinate version of my Cauchy data. I'd like to have a coordinate invariant, because it's a geometric, pro geometric problem, I'd like to have a coordinate invariant a definition of what is the Cauchy data. So the Cauchy data, so, uh, so here I have three things in my Cauchy data, maybe it's not clear, but there are three things in Cauchy data. There is G and DTG, but there is also a slice T is equal to zero, which is a space-like hypersurface in Minkowski. Okay, so if you go back to a more general case, what you'd like to pick is a, a three-dimensional manifold, which will be your slice T is equal to zero in the end. Uh, G restricted to, t, 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 to, t, to your space-like hypersurface will be a Riemannian metric. And then K, which corresponds to DTG, in general will simply be a two tensor, a symmetric two tensor. Okay, so I'm picking a three-dimensional manifold, a Riemannian uh, metric, and a symmetric two tensor. So sigma zero, dimension of sigma zero is three. Uh, G is a symmetric two tensor. Uh, no, sorry, is a Riemannian metric. It's a Riemannian metric on sigma naught, and K is a symmetric two tensor. Okay, so what you want to do is, so this is your initial data, and then I want to relate it to the Einstein equation. So once you construct the, equ the Einstein equation, that is, I take my slice sigma zero, and I'm starting to construct the solution of the Einstein equation. So this is sigma zero, this is my space time m. I'd like, again, this is about local development. So I'm not going to talk about a global, uh, global existence. I'm simply going to construct a local development of my initial data set. So here I have sigma zero on which I have G zero K. And I'm constructing a space time in a neighborhood of sigma zero. And once I do this, um, what will happen is that G zero will correspond to the induced metric by M on, on sigma naught. So G zero will be simply the induced metric uh, on sigma naught. And K will correspond to, do, to the second form of that form on the, of the embedding. Well, it's the second form of, form of, sigma, uh, of the embedding of sigma zero and M. Okay. Okay. So that's the Cauchy data. That's this triplet sigma zero uh, G zero K. Uh, solving the Einstein equation. Sorry, I should have added. Uh, of course, solving the Einstein equation is having this plus satisfying Ricci alpha beta is equal to zero. And it, uh, as we can see in wave coordinates, this turns out to be uh, an evolution problem. Okay, and the question we'll ask uh, this afternoon is, under which regularity do we have local existence for the Einstein equation? And of course, what we'll see is that we can go uh, all the way to curvature naught. Okay, so that's, that's the, okay. So this afternoon, we'll, we'll actually deal with this. Okay.